evening, everyone. Uh, Nancy Howell from Western Cuyahoga Audubon, one of the board members. And here we are, Tuesday, July 6th, at our members meeting and our speakers program. I hope everybody had a great 4th of July weekend. Not too noisy, not too dangerous. Um, but again, welcome for this evening. Um, we have a, a, just a jam cram packed list of of things that we need to talk about and one of the things I want to initially bring up that I just added to the agenda not very long ago is uh, you know people have been hearing about this mysterious bird disease uh, especially around oh the, the eastern seaboard Washington Virginia uh, Delaware places like that as well as the western part of Ohio into Indiana and Illinois. Um, there's really nothing has been found as to what is causing this mysterious illness. The birds develop uh, crusty eyes and they can't see. Uh, some of them develop neurological problems. So, you know, they're, they're, they can't fly because, of course, they just are judging, you know, moving their movements. Um, and the birds that seem to be most affected are our neighborhood birds, blue jays, uh, robins, uh, common grackles, starlings, things like that. But one of the things we don't know is are birds out in the forests and fields and wetlands, are they being affected by this mysterious disease? We don't know if it's bacterial or viral or a parasite or a, a fungus. Again, it still hasn't been determined. Uh, but we seem to notice it, again, in places where birds are concentrating, like people's yards, where you have bird feeders and bird baths. And since we, we all love birds, um, we like to see our birds as healthy as possible. You know, they have so many things going against them with you know, pesticides and roaming cats and climate change and other things. We are suggesting, Western Cuyahoga Audubon is suggesting, uh, removing bird feeders for about seven to ten days uh, and those feeders that you are, are do put back make sure they're cleaned thoroughly with a 10% bleach solution which is one part bleach to nine parts water uh, you know scrubbing them up I mean and we're talking about seed feeders suet feeders peanut feeders um, Oriole feeders, you know, with the oranges and the, and the grape jelly, any kind of feeder that might concentrate birds. Similarly with bird baths, because again, we don't know how serious this, this disease is in tra being transmitted among birds uh, that are congregating. Um, yet we haven't really noticed uh, any problems in Northeast Ohio. Uh, Rehabilitators, wildlife rehabilitators are, are on it. The, the Division of Wildlife in Ohio is on it. Uh, there are some uh, federal uh, groups that are also looking to see what, what might be the cause. But again, nothing really has been determined. So, so we hope that you can keep your eyes open in your neighborhood if you see any birds that look as though they have, again, bad, crusty eyes or they can't fly, uh, they're flopping around because of neurological problems. Um, uh, we can uh, have stuff on our website uh, as to who to contact. Uh, certainly one of the first contacts might be a wildlife rehabilitator like the Lake Erie Nature and Science Center or Penitentiary Glen, which is uh, in Lake County. And uh, you know, we hope that, that you do consider taking your feeders down giving them a good thorough scrubbing and not putting them back up for a little while. Remember, birds don't need to be fed. They've been feeding on stuff before pe people were around. Um, insects, you know, keep, keep native plants in your yard, allow insects to be in your yard. Um, seeds that, that, that they find in plants, again, planting native plants that provide seeds. And again, plants that provide nectar for hummingbirds and the other nectar feeders. Are, is really, really the way to go. So um, we, I, I, with that, I just wanted to mention, and I understand that our public radio station in the Cleveland area, WCPN, which is 90.3 IdeaStream, during their um, 
morning sound of ideas, they are supposed to be having a discussion tomorrow with some uh, bird folks and rehabbers as to you know what what is again this disease. And we can put the website of WCPN in the chat. Uh, I was again just looking at that website and looking to see if they had something already up, uh, like, like announcement as to when it's going to be on, but it was not there that I could find. But uh, again, WCPN Idea Stream, which is 90.3, our local public radio station. All right. And uh, of course, um, we had a very successful. This is our third bullet point, our very successful spring membership drive. We had 24 new members, and uh, those new members are put into a raffle, and we are going to be pulling the names of the winners of the raffle prizes. And I, I don't know if, if anybody's on uh, that, that did get, become a new member at this time. But there's the raffle ticket. And oh, I wish I had somebody here that could help me pull. I'm going to turn my head. And our very first prize, and Betsy, I think it's on our next slide, our very next, okay, there's our, our 24 new members, is a, uh, one of our bags of the organic uh, fair trade uh, birds and beans coffee. And the winner of that, this is our, I think, fourth prize, is Julie Cohen. Julie Cohen, C-O-H-E-N. I don't know if that can, you can read that. Julie Cohen. So that is for the coffee. And I believe Julie will be able to choose what flavor of coffee she likes, if it's a flavor or if it's ground or if it's whole bean. I'm going to write on this coffee. Okay. There you go. All right. So that was the fourth prize. In my head. All right. Flip to the next slide, please, Betsy. Because the next uh, prize are two uh, gift cards for Mitchell's homemade ice cream. They're a $10 value, which means you get $20 worth of ice cream or frozen yogurt, yogurt or sorbet or vegan ice cream. And then uh, you can see from the slide we have a uh, store locator. And who is getting the ice cream? Oh, Annette Pikowski. Yeah, Annette. Yeah. I think it's Pikowski. Yay. Annette, you get the ice cream coupons or gift cards. Ice cream. Good time for ice cream. All righty, let's flip to the next slide. And actually, we have a set of slides because um, Sean Missig, one of our members uh, of WCAS, takes lovely photography, but he also wrote a poem called A Walk in the Park. The poem is on all five of these, these choices. These are, these are um, things that you can hang on your wall. They're framed prints. Um, on cardstock, or the frame is not included, I'm sorry, the, the artwork is printed on cardstock and it can be framed. And there are five choices, and this is one choice. You can see the Canada geese with the um, uh, poem. Next slide, please. And then the next ones will go through seasons. So you have a, a fall season, again, with the same poem. Winter, next slide. There you go. And there's the winter photograph, again, along with the poem. Spring. I like this one. The spring one, along with the poem. And lastly, the summer one with the beautiful uh, tiger swallowtail uh, on the, on the uh, flower. All right. And you again, whoever is the winner and the winner for the our print is Lyle Merriman. Lyle Merriman. And Lyle will get a chance to choose one of those five. So art print. All right. Fabulous. 
Now our last prize is a big one. It is from the donation from the rock pile. And you can see there's a, a little hopper feeder. There'll be a 25 pound bag of <coughs> bird seed, $25 gift certificate that can, the winner can redeem. And so really all in all, it's about a $72 uh, prize uh, package. So who is going to get that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. And that will be Joan Rubin. Joan Rubin. R-U-B-I-N. There you go. All right. And if Joan is on, again, we can talk a little bit about uh, either picking that up or we can pick it up for you um, for some in some way, shape, or form. You will get that awesome prize. Wow. Congratulations, everybody, and thank you for becoming new members, um, and we just have so much happening. All right, so next slide, please. Um, one of the other things that we've had happen is we, along with seven other chapters, uh, 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 Ohio Audubon chapters, as part of the uh, Council of Ohio Audubon chapters, or COAC, um, we ha came to, or had some information from the Institute for Bird Populations that there are bird banding stations in Central and South America that need funding desperately. And those bird banding stations uh, that was, were chosen to fund are in Nicaragua. And the funds that were uh, obtained through these eight chapters, including Western Cuyahoga, uh, we are able to, to uh, fund the equipment and some staff and public education at a site called Ometepe, which is on an island in a volcano in Lake Nicaragua, and then Los Guatuzos, which is part of a, um, a wildlife refuge in Nicaragua. Now you might say, well, why in the world are we supporting banding stations in, in Central or South America or in Nicaragua? Well, think about it. Our neotropical migrants, the songbirds, like that indigo bunting, like wood thrush, black and white warbler, and so many other birds, they only spend their time here in Ohio and further north to breed. Where are they spending the rest of their time? Central or South America. So the uh, monitoring overwinter survival, which is, again, the banding project down in Nicaragua, will be banding not only local species, but also the migrants. And because we need to know what habitats those birds use uh, when they're, non -breed, when they're uh, not breeding with, on their wintering grounds. It could be very, very different from the habitats that we have up here. So a, a shrubland species like the chestnut-sided warbler may utilize a vi like a, a tropical forest uh, as opposed to a shrubby area. So again, we just don't have all the data as to what the birds are doing further south. So this will definitely be a help. All right, uh, next slide, please. We are still uh, raising funds. Uh, our goal, we did uh, not quite reach our goal from Western Cuyahoga of $500, but we did uh, donate. And we want to replenish our funds. Uh, so we are hoping that uh, if you are interested in, in donating, you can uh, see the um, uh, place, uh, our Facebook fundraiser, as well as uh, on our website, uh, we have a, a navigational button that you can uh, fly. And I think we even have some more stuff going on to help, again, replenish our funds for this uh, bird banding station, the MOSI station. Next, please. All right, next is Michelle Brocious, again, one of our board members and field trip co-coordinator. All right, thank you, Nancy. Hello, everyone. Um, next slide, please, Betsy. All right, so I have a number of things to talk about today. I'm going to discuss the Christmas and July raffle, our second Saturday bird walks, uh, the Tremont bird walk that we have going on, virtual field trips, evening bird walks, and uh, a little bit about how you can connect with us on social media. Next slide, please. 
All right, so we are selling raffle tickets for our Christmas in July raffle through July 23rd to benefit a banding station in Nicaragua through the Institute for Bird Population, so what Nancy was just talking about. Uh, the, drawing plate, the drawing will take place on July 25th. There are two prize bundles. The grand prize is valued at 500 and the second place prize is valued at 100. Uh, prize bundles include items like a WCAS membership, art prints, coffee, a bird bath, and feeders. Uh, we are selling tickets for $5 each or five tickets for $20. Um, we are raising $500 for our chapter contribution to IBP. Access funds raised with this raffle will support other chapter projects and activities. So please visit our website, wcaudubon.org, and click the Christmas and July raffle tile for details and to participate. Next slide, please. All right, the second Saturday bird walks with Bill Dininer and Dave Gross Kemper are back on as many COVID restrictions have been lifted for those who are vaccinated. However, if you haven't been vaccinated, it is recommended that you still wear a mask. Uh, please join us every second Saturday of the month at 9 a.m. at the Rocky River Nature Center parking lot. We usually meet between the upper and lower parking lots and then take a few hours to walk the Nature Center trails. Next slide, please. All right, this past second Saturday took place on June 12th, and uh, this is Bill Dininer's report. He says, we had a good number of observers, 27, attend the second Saturday of the month bird walk at the Rocky River Nature Center. It was a mostly sunny walk with the temperatures starting at 76 degrees and ending at 81 degrees. We tallied 54 species for the walk. Most of the regular expected birds were spotted. Four ruby-throated hummingbirds were observed. The Acadian flycatcher was seen and heard in seven locations. The barred owl did a flyby. The yellow-throated vireo was singing and then gave us a good look as it dropped from the treetops, showing off its brilliant yellow throat. Four yellow warblers were in several locations. Three American red stars were busy singing. The best highlight was a hooded warbler. The hooded warbler was perched on a branch in an open area directly in front of us, sat and sang for about five minutes for all to observe. So that was uh, Bill's report for this past second Saturday. All right, next slide, please. All right, as a result of our Urban Birding Cleveland with David Lindo event in November 2019, Tom Romito of Western Cuyahoga Audubon began presenting at block club meetings in Tremont to introduce residents to the idea of Tremont as an urban birding destination. Now, after a pause due to COVID-19, Tremont West Development Corporation remembers our initial conversations and is interested in bringing a bird walk to the neighborhood. We have therefore planned monthly bird walks to take place on the fourth Saturday of the month starting at 9 a.m., meeting at the towpath public parking lot on Abbey Avenue. From here, we bird the Ohio and Erie Canal towpath trail towards Scranton Flats. Nancy Howell is co-leading the bird walks with another guest leader for most of the Saturdays. Again, COVID restrictions have been dropped, but it is recommended to wear a mask if you are not fully vaccinated. To register, please visit wcautobot.org and click the Tremont Bird Walks tile. Next slide, please. All right, last month our virtual field trip was at the Cuyahoga Valley National Park in search of tanagers, orioles, and wood duck. At least six participants visited the preserve throughout the month, or not the preserve, the park, I am currently compiling the bird list, journaling, and photos submitted to me into a digital scrapbook. So if you haven't seen or if you haven't sent me your items, please get those over to me by end of day Friday, July 9th. That's this Friday. I will then present the scrapbook at our virtual meetup next week on Wednesday, July 14th at 7 p.m. Even if you didn't have a chance to visit the park last month, you are still more than welcome to attend the virtual meetup in which I will share the scrapbook for discussion. Uh, next slide, please. All right, July's virtual field trip takes place at the Cope Family Reservation in Avon Lake, where we will be looking for the red-headed woodpecker and eastern wood peewee. Uh, during your visit to the park, I encourage you to do any of the following activities. Take photographs, draw a picture, or create art inspired by what you've seen. Um, tally identified species or journal your experience. Send your items to me and your contributions will be published to a digital scrapbook and shared on our website and on social media. We will also have an optional virtual meetup to share our experiences and take a look at the scrapbook. You can get more information and register for this virtual field trip by visiting our website, wcaudubon.org, and clicking the Virtual Field Trips 2021 tile on the home page. Next slide, please. 
All right, uh, this month we are kicking off a series of evening bird walks. A huge thank you to Nancy Howell for dreaming up this idea and volunteering as the bird walk leader. I will be supporting the bird walk this month as well. Uh, these bird walks are perfect if you need a nice walk to wind down from the day and evening is a great time to look and listen for birds as they begin to settle for the night or for some just beginning to be active. Walks will be held on the third Wednesday of each month at 7 p.m. Each walk takes place at a different location. Uh, this month we will bird the Lake to Lake Trail. And this is so new that we may not yet have it up on our website. So please mark your calendar and check back to register. Uh, next slide, please. All right, and finally, um, please stay connected with us in between our virtual and in-person activities by following us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Be sure to use hashtag WC Audubon when you post a bird photo on Instagram for a chance to be featured on our Instagram page. If selected, I will reach out to you with details. Also, many of our virtual programs are recorded like this speaker series meeting and our virtual field trips that I mentioned and can be found on our WC Audubon YouTube channel, so be sure to subscribe. Um, next slide, please. Oh, that's it for me. Thank you. Thanks so much, Michelle. Uh, as I told you, we've got a ton of stuff happening and there's more. But did you look at those beautiful photographs that were associated with the with all that Michelle was talking about? Yeah, that's the Michelle right there that took those photographs. That hooded warbler. Wow, how about Thank that? Thank you. And, and the baby wood duck, you know, just kind of looking with the big eyes. So cute. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I, I appreciate good photography and, and Michelle is, is really a great photographer. Thank um, you. Yeah. Kurt Miske couldn't be uh, with us this evening, so I will be doing some of the announcements of the Bluebird Box uh, uh, presentation. Um, we have a, a series of five Bluebird Boxes at the uh, Lewis Road Riding Ring uh, in Rocky River uh, Reservation of the Cleveland Metro Parks and a couple of them are, are doing quite well. So next slide, please. There are a number of volunteers that go out uh, and keep track of the nesting uh, of the birds and their, uh, this information is being sent to Project Nest Watch. So uh, again, it's all going into some, a database. Um, so Nest Box 2 had uh, a set of eastern bluebirds. Look at those beautiful, four beautiful eggs in the nest. And that was uh, in late May. Next, please. Another of the boxes, Box 4, had tree swallows. And uh, <laughs> tree swallows, of course, are a native species. Of, I hate to say, but house sparrows, yeah, that we evict them out of the nest boxes. Uh, but look at those, all those little snuggly baby tree swallows. One, two, three, four. I count at least five little bodies in there. So sweet. And again, that was early June. Next, please. Uh, again, this is what the tree swallow nest looks like. Okay? And you can see tree swallows like to put feathers in there. It's not their own feathers. Those look mostly like duck and goose feathers in there. So that's kind of a fun thing to, to know is that, you know, birds have certain ways that they like to construct nests and tree swallows do not build their own nest or, or cavity. So they use nest boxes or they use cavities already uh, drilled into wood as a bluebird would do too. So, so look at that, how that nest is in that box. Next, please. And there's the nestlings of the bluebirds, uh, one, two, three, and oh, I see four. There they are, four eggs, four babies. That looks like a good, good thing. Next. And look at those baby bluebirds. They are just overflowing the nest. They're just about ready to fledge. And you can notice they have lots of speckles on them. They are part of the thrush family, so you, I think you all have seen young robins with all the speckles on them. Well, young bluebirds have speckles on their back as well as speckles on their front. So you'll look at that, how sweet. And so again, keep track. Um, and um, again, maybe next year, think about volunteering and um, we'll see how many birdies we can bring off in those boxes. Next, please. And I believe Michelle is going to be talking uh, about our uh, 
bird-friendly native plant sale. Karoo was, was not able to be with us this evening. Yes, yes. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so we're having a native plant sale and bird walk at the Tremont Arts and Culture Festival, September 18th and 19th. Uh, please pre-purchase your plants at our store at wcaudubon.org. Uh, next slide, please. All right, we're looking for volunteers to promote native plants and soil sale on social media and deliver plant and soil orders to customers and to work the fall sale. So please contact Haru Sabone if interested. Um, her information is um, right there on the screen. Next slide, please. Now we're also selling soil made from composted food scraps uh, via Rust Belt Riders, a Cleveland-based company. Uh, place your orders before July 10th at the wcaudubon.org store, um, and proceeds benefit our organization. All right, next slide. Again, thank you so much, Michelle. Uh, I just want to add that the, the flowers and plants that we get at the plant sale are really maintained well. They're from a small grower right here in uh, Columbia Station, and she, she babies her plants, and they're just really beautiful. Uh, I, uh, we ha I helped to deliver one of the bags of soil uh, last month, and I'll tell you, I wanted to rip into that bag to see what that soil was like and, you know, just run my fingers through it because, again, a good composted soil made from, again, the, the uh, waste uh, of plant, plants and, and, and uh, things that people have put into compost buckets for Rust Belt Riders, uh, it, it's beautiful, beautiful soil. Uh, Amanda Sabrowski will be talking about a couple of, of projects with the Northeast Ohio Chimney Swift Conservation Society. Amanda, how are you doing tonight? Hi, good, thanks. Um, next slide. Uh, this is the tower that was just recently put up in Walker Road Park um, on Walker Road right on the border of Bay Village and Avon Lake. Um, you can see that the, the city got stones around there for me. They didn't do anything so that we come up between them, so I'm going to have to fix that. But it looks like these are weeds around the chimneys with tower, but they aren't. They're all native plants. Many of them came from nodding onions originally, but uh, actually came out of my yard. So. Um, I'm, I'm thinking that next year they'll probably bloom. Um, next slide. Next slide. Oh, there you go. Okay. Um, this is the tower that they're putting up, the city of Kent is putting up. It is just beautiful. Um, they had been a center for chimney swifts. They actually had a professor there that studied chimney swifts for like 40 years and um, they they had a huge population and because they had these big old chimneys and that had been taken down a lot of them and uh, they were prompted to put up this uh, chimney swift tower because one of the last big ones at the police station is going to be coming down so uh, they commissioned the, the design for this and those tiles, you can see some of the tiles that have been put in uh, were made by a local artist, uh, M. Ulma, U-L-M. Uh, if you Google her, you can see some more of her work. It's just beautiful. Um, it's actually the thing, the, uh, oh, thank you. Um, the tower costs about $20,000, and they're a little bit shy, and they've asked if um, we can give them any, any cash. I told them. Uh, you know, send us some information about who the money would, you know, would be taking the money and anything about the plan. So um, they haven't said that yet, but um, I'm planning on getting some from Northeast Ohio Chimney Swift Conservation Society. Maybe um, WCAS could give some too, but I, it won't be anywhere near like thousands. I, I told her from, uh, for me anyway. So um, if Keep an eye out for when they send us more information. Maybe people can kick in a little bit of money. Thanks. 
Thanks so much, Amanda. Wow, you could see a real, the, you know, the beauty of, of the one in Kent, the simplicity but functionality of the one in Bay Village, and so the, it can run the gamut. So, uh, you know, mm -hmm. a piece of artwork or something a little bit more simple. I don't know if the birds really care, but certainly uh, it appeals to the eye. And, uh, and again, having information, educational information, uh, about the tower, about the birds is is really crucial too. So I, I hope all of them have have some information. Yeah, I uh, don't know if you noticed the one on the tower in um, in Walker has one, and what they're also going to make me uh, a little plaque of information about native plants. Um, to Fabulous! In, all right, uh, the native plants. So. Yeah, educate, educate, yeah. educate. Best we can do. Yeah. Yep. All righty. Thanks again, Amanda. Uh, next, we have Drina Nemus, uh, who is the chairperson of our book club. Drina, how are you this evening? I'm good this evening, and I'm I'm happy to hear about the the uh, Swift the Chimney Swift uh, Tower in Bay Village. I'll have to check it out. I live in Bay Village, and uh, this is great news. Okay. Okay. Um. So. Looking forward to the upcoming year and the selection of books is just outstanding. Um, Gloria and I and others have been looking at what would be of interest and uh, expanding a little bit more into some historical fiction with where the world ends and then with a real life story that's a, an audacious crime in the feather thief and then a classic, Silent Spring, by Rachel Carson. And I have to admit, with some embarrassment, that I have not completely read this. So um, it'll be um, part of my important reading list, uh, classic. And then also we'd like to have a one selection during the year uh, of our quarterly sessions that would uh, appeal to children and to parents and uh, so we're looking at what might work there. Um, we're very interested in what people have to say about book clubs and particularly this book club and so there is a survey located as you can see on the screen there and please uh, take the book club and help us get our information together for what would uh, be like kind of citizen data, uh, a population study. And then also we'll be keeping up with the book club at the Guardians of Nature uh, workshops, which are the third and fourth Thursdays of the month. And then also you can check out uh, our previous uh, book club sessions on the homepage. And uh, those are recordings, and uh, we've had some wonderful authors in the past, so they're, they're worthwhile to check out, maybe even for a second time. So thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Drina. Uh, I'm going to have to look at that, that when the world, when the world ends. Yikes, that sounds terrifying. It is. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Betsy O'Hagan, our, our digital strategist, has all, a few more announcements. Betsy? Hi, everyone. I'd like to just say a few, few words about the Guardians of Nature meeting, the photography contest this month, and the bird-friendly coffee offer that we have at the online store. Uh, the Guardians of Nature projects, just to give you an update, uh, this is, these are a couple of the things that we're working on. We're helping with the logistics of the uh, Christmas and July raffle, and that includes delivering uh, the two uh, winter bags. We're right now looking for someone, if you have a particular interest or um, talent at uh, uh, packaging gifts, uh, we're wondering if there's anyone out there who would just be very excited to put the grand prize package together, uh, possibly with some a lovely tissue paper or in a decorated bag or whatever you would like to do and uh, organize that so that both of the winning prizes can be delivered and make a nice splash. 
Uh, we're also going to be talking, as Serena mentioned, about the book club programs that encourage people to please contribute to the survey, uh, to use their survey, so, th so that that will help us to understand what you're interested in and then uh, develop and plan the fall programs according to what you're interested in. The third thing is the fall native plant sale, and you heard a little bit about that uh, from Michelle uh, on, be on behalf of Karu Tsuboni. Um, we're going to be choosing the native plants and uh, helping out wherever we can to make that happen. There's also a board nomination process that's about to be launched, and that will take place over a period of uh, several weeks through a couple of months to uh, recruit um, and um, put forth nominations for the board, and this is to help um, uh, help seek a wider canvas, a wider area to recruit of people who might be interested in leadership uh, at the chapter, whether it's uh, on a committee or as a board member. Um, the final thing is we'll also be talking about a digital transformation fund, and that is a specific fund to raise uh, support dollars to help um, support all of the wonderful digital, educational digital resources that WCIS hosts. So those again are the third and fourth Thursdays of the month. This month, July 15 and 22nd at 7 p.m. at the Virtual Conference Center. And we do have previous meetings uh, at the YouTube channel. You can watch all of them there to get caught up. The next is uh, just details about the July Photography Contest. This month's featured bird is the killdeer. The contest runs for the length of the month uh, through the 30th. And then the winners are announced at the following month's uh, member meeting and speaker program. And uh, it's a nominal fee to participate. Uh, youth and adults are welcome. And uh, all the monthly winners go together into an annual yearly contest for additional prizes. And of course, the donations support chapter conservation education. The final thing is talking about uh, saving birds with coffee. So. Uh, WCIS has been a longtime provider of birds and beans coffee, and that's um, roasted and distributed out of um, uh, out just outside of Boston, Massachusetts. And the coffee is uh, delivered within generally with easily within a five-day period once it's ordered. Uh, and orders are all in, please, by the tenth of every month. And uh, these are Smithsonian certified migratory center. Uh, coffee and the farms that produce them. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Betsy. I'm back again. One more, I think, quick announcement that we have. Betsy, uh, next slide, please. Oh, yes. I know you thought we talked about ice cream earlier. That was one of the prizes for the, the spring membership drive. But we still, we are fundraising by selling these Mitchell's Homemade Ice Cream gift cards. Again, $10 denominations. There is a, uh, again, on the uh, WCES store, you can see that there is a place that you can uh, get that information and put an order in, and we can get the cards to you. So, again, it's ice cream season, or frozen yogurt, or sorbet, or vegan ice cream. It's it's, it's great stuff, and it's local, too. Uh, next slide. And don't forget, next month uh, we have a meeting, and that will be on uh, Tuesday, August 3rd. And that will begin again with announcements at 7.30. The speaker is Dr. Jim Tomko from the Audubon Society of Greater Cleveland. He's talking about don't touch that nest. Or can you? Uh, bird nests, eggs, and feathers are protected, or are they? So uh, Dr. Tomko will talk a little bit more about, you know, if you disturb a nest, if you find a feather, that type of thing. Um, what rules, what laws are being broken, and how the, the um, uh, these laws, which began many, many years ago, uh, helped to uh, 
create the National Audubon Society as well. So, so we hope that you can join us. Again, don't touch that nest. So join us then. And this evening, there we are. I'm sorry it took so long to go through all of these announcements, but this evening we have Tammy Fierro Zeiss. Um, she has been with uh, Audubon of Miami Valley here in Ohio, but now is it Audubon Washington, Washington State that is. And I think you probably are all familiar with they're having a, a terrible heat wave there in that northwestern part of the, 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 the continent. Um, and uh, But uh, Tammy is going to share with us something that I think we all need to continue, not just when we're, we're talking about it this year, but in the future. Inclusive engagement for everyone, 2020 and beyond, encouraging inclusive activism and environmental engagement in a virtual world. This may help us, uh, again, get some new folks as board members to Western Cuyahoga, because we certainly want to be much, much, much more uh, inclusive. So Tammy, thank you so much for this uh, evening. And we look forward to hearing and seeing your wonderful presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for having me. I'm excited to give this presentation. Um, I am just going to bring this up for you if I can. Give me one second, sorry. <laughs> My computer decided this moment to be slow, unfortunately. Unmute, Nancy. We love technology. Technology is amazing, especially when it actually works. Here we go. Can everyone see that? Let's see something. Okay. Can everyone All right, so everyone should be able to see a slide that says Inclusive Engagement for Everyone 2020. Inclusive, diverse, equitable, and accessible environmental activism. Is that what everyone is seeing right now? Yes. Yes, I can see it. okay. Yes. Perfect. Fantastic. All right. So firstly, uh, thank you for having me. I appreciate you guys giving me your attention a little bit for this evening. Um, I'm Tammy. And I want to put out there, so I am Latinx, and I am part of the LGBTQ community. I will be touching on these topics specifically in terms of engagement and um, creating spaces where those particular communities will want to engage with you. Um, I, on my maternal side, just so we are clear on why I'm comfortable talking, speaking on this topic, uh, on my maternal side, I'm German, Irish, mix. <laughs> on my dad's side, however, my paternal side, um, most of my family is from a two places in Mexico specifically, um, Tetelis in Puebla and Morelia in Michoacan. 
Furthermore, um, we are of indigenous Mexican ancestry, specifically Nahua and Otomi. Um, therefore, when I speak on these topics, that is the view I am coming from. Again, thanks for giving me that moment to kind of explain that. Um, so in that, let's get going. So I want to talk about this picture. Um, what's something you notice about, notice about this picture right away? Feel free to just speak out. Looking at the faces and the people attending, what do you immediately notice? Well, it's pretty white. Yeah, they're all, they all look, yeah, Caucasian. Yeah. But more than that, what else do we notice? Perhaps, perhaps older. Older, great. And if no one's noticed, no one's using a wheelchair. No one's using any kind of cane or um, other accessibility device. And there only seems to be one speaker, and there doesn't seem to be anyone who's doing deaf interpretation. So out of the 50 people that were there, of just about, that is kind of what a lot of environmental spaces are, are geared for, right? And it can be an uncomfortable topic, and I want to apologize because some of you may be uncomfortable, right? It may be kind of weird to look at this picture and go, oh, yeah, that is weird, isn't it? But that's what this particular talk is going to be about. How can we make this space, this picture change? How can we make this picture more equitable, more inclusive, more accessible to everyone? Hopefully, by the end of this small presentation, we're going to have a, hopefully time for some minor Q&A, right? There will be some toolkits that you guys can go to or some kind of direction in terms of what is best practices to, inc to create an idea which is inclusive, diverse, equitable, and accessible environment in your organization and in just in general. Basic steps towards an idea-centered centered organization. Intentionality. So what does intentionality mean? Intentionality isn't just saying a random sentence in your diversity statement that says, we welcome people of all creeds, and that's it. That's not intentionality. Intentionality is saying it is crucial to framing your organization that you and your organization are intentionally inclusive. That means you make a commitment to inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility, and you tell everyone about it. It isn't a lone statement somewhere. It is something that you practice, you preach, and it is on every piece of material you guys create. Diversity statements need to be prominent, specific, and most importantly, need to pledge to center marginalized voices and communities. Another important step towards creating an idea-centered idea -centered organization is having leader, leaders from communities lead activities, organization initiatives, and programming created for those communities. For instance, if you have a June of Pride Month, right? If you have a queer, openly, you know, LGBTQIA plus bird walk, you should have someone who is in that community leading that programming and helping kind of design that programming and what that should look like for that community. Because they may very well have insights that you might not think of. And by creating this opportunity for them to lead and be engaged, it makes others feel welcome and wanted in your space. Not just allowed or tolerated. Remember, 
when you're partnering with local organizations, communities, leaders, and other members to achieve this, please understand that it is on you guys to reach out to them. And the reason for that, which sounds kind of presumptuous, is that a lot of people feel uncomfortable asking for space. It, it shouldn't, it, it isn't their job to come to you and say, hey, do you have room for me? No, you want them to know that you have room for them, that more than that, you are making the space for them. Does that make sense to everyone so far? Okay. For three, uh, center marginalized voices. This should include an effort to center programming and organizational efforts, not just on creating equity, but uplifting. This can include an organizational committee, a welcome message at the beginning of all activities, and a dedication to accessible community resources. What I mean by a welcome message, not just, hey, how you doing? How are you going? How's everything? Here's what we're doing today. It's, hey, I want to take a moment to thank everyone for coming. Um, I especially want everyone to know that this is a welcoming space for BIPOC and LGBTQ voices. Um, welcome. This is a safe space for you, and if you have preferred names or pronouns, please let me know, and I will do my best to respect them. It's that simple. It's something like that, which may not seem super overt, but can be really changing in an attitude for someone who maybe might, might be unsure of if they belong or if they're safe. There are a lot of people who are not out in the LGBTQ community, and I'm specifically speaking to that right now. And that means they might be honestly a little hesitant to to be in spaces where it's a majority of, of older folks or maybe they are afraid their family is going to find out, right? As someone who was in that position, it took a very long time for me to actually feel safe in environmental spaces because you never knew if someone would somehow, you know, go back to your parents or your family, right? You, you never knew if that was going to be the case. Um, and there are still a lot of people who have that dilemma. So we're going to kind of switch gears here. Um, I wanted to take a moment and ask if anyone had any questions before we kind of move on to different barriers in both physical and digital access, which is something that has been really prominent, at least especially in the last year with COVID. Um, do we have any questions about that last part or any need for clarification? Tammy, this is Chris. I do have a question. So of course. first of all, thanks for coming and talking about this. Um, but from your perspective and experience, why is, why is equity and diversity and inclusion important for an Audubon chapter like WCAS? Okay. Uh, thank you for asking that. I really appreciate that. Um, frankly speaking, um, a lot of outdoor spaces, when you're thinking of environmental space, you are perhaps missing an entire swath of, of communities that may be underserved or marginalized. And the reason it's important, environmental specifically, reason it's important to those communities is things like pollution, or they have a lack of green space, or they simply do not have access to things like the opportunity to go birding. They might not even know that that's something that that that's a hobby they can do. Um, and when you ask, well, why is it important? Well, when you have only one person talking in a room over all of these other people, doesn't that, doesn't that mean that only one idea or one voice is being heard? And there could be so many other people, right, in that room, hypothetically, that have amazing ideas and thoughts and ways to create um, great opportunities in an organization. 
But if you're only hearing from one person, you would never know that. Furthermore, uh, it's a way to uplift a lot of these communities. It's important, too, because it also brings in new life to an organization. You can say, okay, well, we seem to be doing great on our own. Right. Um, but wouldn't you do even better if you had more people dedicated to your cause? Right? If you were able to get the word out twice as much. If you were to generate new ideas twice as fast. Does that kind of answer that question? Yeah, that's great. Thanks a lot. I appreciate You're it. You're welcome. Okay. So moving on to equity and access, digital barriers. So COVID kind of completely changed the game. Before, uh, there were a lot of organizations um, and chapters within Audubon that were kind of moving towards digital programming, Zoom meetings every once in a while. A lot of uh, chapters actually used Facebook Live, which was really interesting, as well as Instagram. However, once COVID hit, field trips just weren't, I mean, they weren't a possibility anymore, right? But more than that, it revealed that while you could have all the Zoom meetings in the world, you could print your membership uh, newsletters and send them out like old school, right? Some people just didn't have access. They didn't have access except for on their smartphone, and or, the, or they just didn't have access, period. Federal and other research data suggests that about 14% of students do not have reliable internet access, and that about 17% of adults exclusively have internet access via their mobile device. That's a huge number when you really think about it. But why is that? Lots of reasons poor internet services, rural, uh, simply no one is providing to these particular places. Maybe it's a cost financial barrier. But what can you do? Well, sometimes it's not those things. Sometimes it genuinely is language barrier. When you are having services online, make sure they can reach the widest audience available. That means multi-language transcripts or closed captioning available for all content, or at least the majority of content, especially video content, um, and available for offline use and downloading, right? So if someone's using their phone to access your website and it's image heavy and there's so much just going on, or and they have poor connection, are they going to be able to load your website? I mean, remember back in the day when we had dial-up and it would take like five minutes to load a simple black and white photo? Are, are you, are, would you as a person be able to sit there and use data that you could be using to go to a website and pay your bills or access your, your child's education to go to a website? It's important to have plain text versions of certain content, if not all content, right? Especially when you're talking about emails, so like newsletters, right? It sounds crazy and almost like a step back, but truly, every time you have an image in there or some kind of fancy like lettering or anything like that, it uses data and that can really slow down an internet connection, especially one that's already poor. E-readers also kind of play into that. E-readers are widely used accessibility tools. I actually use one for college, um, and it sounds crazy, but it is very, very helpful, especially when you're looking at blocks and blocks of text or when you're trying to study. And that's just casual use. Some people genuinely depend on these for functioning. And it's important to understand that this isn't something, some random device that sometimes people use. This is a crucial part to a lot of people's lives. Image heavy material makes data, again, hard to load, and it can be kind of a burden when trying to download a page and having your e-reader try to pick up with that, especially if you include images, but you don't include alternate text. So 
what that means is if a web page loads and it has doesn't have alternate text, if the e-reader can't pick up what that image is, which nine times out of ten it can't, your audience is basically missing crucial data. Right? They're not going to know what that image is. If there's alternate text, at the very least, they can get a description of the image. And the more descriptive, the better. The next thing I'm going to talk about is virtual paywalls. Thankfully, a lot of Audubon chapters are really good about this. There are no virtual payroll, paywalls, nine times out of 10. It's fabulous. But continuing to offer free or pay-as-you-can activities versus paywall activities is really crucial in kind of limiting those digital barriers. Furthermore, when we're talking about digital barriers and they, they simply don't have access to this, right? This is not something, this is not a technology that either they're proficient in or for whatever reason is something that is available to them. Activities should have both an online and offline version, if possible. Sometimes, obviously, that isn't possible, especially when we're in a pandemic. But when it is possible, that should probably be a consideration. Okay, we're going to kind of switch gears here and say physical barriers. I do, I do have a question. Oh, of course. Um, I don't know what a paywall thing, what did you, oh my goodness, I, I completely forgot what it was. That, that last thing, yes. um, what is that? Okay, absolutely. You know what? I should have explained that. I'm sorry, but let me kind of define that for you. So, for instance, have you ever gone to a news website and they pop up and they won't let you read the article unless you subscribe to their website? Or you're trying to pay for a service on a website, right? Say you want to join a Zoom meeting, but it's $5 per person. That's a paywall. For instance, um, another example is Say you have a collection of videos on your website of past member meetings or speaker events. But in order to get access to that, you have to pay $50. And while $50 might not seem like a lot to you, $50 might be like three, worth, three weeks worth of groceries. $50 is possibly two days worth of pay or a day's worth of pay for some people. Um, that's what I mean, a paywall, a financial barrier that is based on having to pay to access information digitally. Thank you. Very welcome. Any other questions? Nope. Okay. So we're going to talk about physical barriers now. Um, Physical barriers of access aren't just, you know, hard trails, right, or unpaved walks, but can be a lot of different things that may have never crossed your mind. Um, for instance, so if you're doing field trips, outdoor birding, or any other outdoor engagement activity, accessibility should be at the forefront of your mind. Um, and I don't just mean, oh, well, the walk needs to be paved, right? Um, accessibility is also transportation. Accessibility is also how long is this walk? Um, are there any very steep inclines? Uh, is portions of it unpaved? Interestingly enough, there's actually an organization called Birdability that has partnered with Audubon. And it actively works towards creating equity and accessibility in birding. This includes creating a GIS-based accessible trail map, which is community source and is free to use. There is a link at the end in my sources that I will be happy to give to all of you. It is a wonderful tool, and because it is community source, all of these trails are verified to be accessible for many different needs. For number two, uh, again, it's remove financial barriers. Financial barriers, unlike digitally, um, can sometimes also really include transportation costs. So I know when I was a student, 
Um, there was a lot of ride sharing simply because a lot of us either could not afford the $10 in gas or didn't have reliable transportation. But because only a few of us had reliable transportation, that meant that often people wouldn't be able to go. You could only fit so many people in a car. More than that though, um, offering transportation can be things like scholarships. So field trip scholarships, offering to pay for a certain number of people to either take public transportation or renting a van, right? And having a designated pickup drop-off spot. Um, or even simply having someone come get these, this person at a designated time. It also means pay as you can for activities and different things, um, much like a digital, removing a digital financial barrier. It also includes equipment. So I know we all know binoculars are expensive. Uh, a good pair can run upwards of thousands of dollars, and even an okay pair can be a couple hundred. Having binoculars is really important if, for, for a lot of birding ventures, right? Um, I cannot tell you how many times I personally have been without my binoculars and everyone can see what's going on and I'm just standing there like, sure wish I could see that bird. <laughs> Having equipment like loaner binoculars or tripods or other hiking equipment available eliminates a huge barrier. A lot of people simply cannot just go out and find binoculars unless it's like the cheap $20 ones. And even then, that's not, that's not creating equity between the person who has the goodish $100 pair versus the person who has the $20 pair and they still can't see the bird. It's, it's a very defeating moment because they still can't participate in that activity with you. They're there, but everyone else is up here and they're still stuck looking at a bush. Does that make sense? I want to kind of pause on that specific one because um, some chapters do have rental, rental binoculars and some, you know, the cost is kind of expensive. But there are trade programs I've noticed where um, people, you know, give their old beat up binoculars, still functional, to chapters or different organizations to have as either a scholarship, right? You have give someone a pair of binoculars to keep or to loan out during programs. Is that something you guys have heard of at all? Yes, and we are looking into having some pairs of binoculars in the near future. We do have a grant from National Audubon, uh, and uh, we hope that we can get a, a few pairs. There are some $100 pairs that are actually pretty good, so we've been looking into it. Oh, that's awesome. That is absolutely wonderful. Um, yeah, then no, that's a huge barrier that a lot of people, they don't actually think about. Um, so that's amazing that you guys are. Um, I do want to touch on the last point. Don't treat accessible outings as a special event. These should be regular occurring and kind of a given. Um, it's, it's never great to single out an event like, oh, we're being accessible. It's, it's not good luck. <laughs> it's not very nice and it's rather exclusionary. Um, that's just a small note. And that is based on feedback that I actually have gotten um, from different peers of mine who are um, disabled or chronically ill or for other reasons have um, barriers of access. Okay. So on this page, I'm gonna describe it and we do have a small description down at the bottom. Um, it is, an accessible trail that goes to an overlook that is really good for spotting hawks and other such birds of prey. Um, 
in the left upper corner, we have my friend Imani. Um, and there is a small stall set up that basically explains the bird blind. But what I want to point out is that this path is mostly accessible. And it is in a spot that you can bird from successfully. There is not a lot of barriers of access here. There's actually a paved road right along that tree line. So that's a really a pretty good example of a barrier-free area that is still accessible and very birdful. In the lower right-hand corner, um, I want to give an example of a great remove, barrier removal, which is a rented van. Uh, this van seated about 10 people. Uh, we would take it often for birding outings simply because of not only the location, but the sheer amount of people that wanted to go. Um, this renting a van or any kind of transportation and offering it as a way to eliminate that barrier is fantastic. And you will have people who will engage in that and will use this resource. As long as you make it very known, people will engage. Okay, we're gonna kind of bring it back around and go back to that diversity, inclusion, equity, and accessibility. Again, before I begin this, are there any other questions on the previous part? No? Okay, we will move on then. Diversity, inclusion, equity, and accessibility should be a crucial part of your organizational pillars in order to create a welcoming and safe environment for all members of your community. Considering welcome messages at the start of all organizational activities. Multilingual opportunities and materials. Um, in this case, I'm going to be speaking to the Latinx, Latin, uh, slash Hispanic communities. Um, this means that the organizational leader all of the organization materials for the activity and activity programming are offered primarily in a secondary language that is not English, right? So a, sec a, language, a language that is not English. In this case, Spanish would be preferred. Um, if that means that your organizational leader that is leading this activity is fluent in both Spanish and English, that is perfect. If that means, an example of would be you have a say a transcript of this very meeting, and someone has transcribed it into Spanish. That is a great uh, example of accessibility. For number two, focus programming focused on BIPOC and LGBTQIA plus voices. So I'm going to take a moment and kind of explain that particular language. BIPOC is Black, Indigenous, persons of color. And LGBTQIA plus is lesbian, gay, bi, transsexual, queer, transgender, queer, intersex, and asexual, aromantic, allied, plus voices. It's a very long acronym, and there are more letters to it, but it's a wonderful acronym. Programming made for, and more importantly, made by members of this community should be created by members of this community and led by, this member, by the members of this community. And that sounds really like I'm trying to drive home a very specific point, but if you want people to feel welcome, you need to create this space for them. Furthermore, programming can be made specifically only for these communities or centered on their experiences, safety, and voices. Again, last month was Pride Month. There was a slew of pride and queer-only events that were centered around these voices. And while allies, right, were welcome, it was specifically for this kind of engagement. It ties into number three, which is create an overt, safe, and welcoming space. For Latinx, Latin, Hispanic communities, 
This means having materials readily available and resource cre resources created by these leaders. For the queer community, this can mean having outing policies, which I'm going to pause here um, and say an outing policy is something where if a non-openly LGBTQ plus person comes to you and says, I'm not open, however, this is how I am, you don't say anything, right? There is a sense of trust and safety when they engage in your organization. It means that you will not focus on that for them and that they are trusting you to keep whatever identity they feel they need to keep safe and respect their boundaries. This also includes asking of preferred names and pronouns. For instance, uh, for this particular meeting, a welcome message might be, hi, uh, welcome to our meeting, great. Want to thank everyone for coming, especially our BIPOC and LGBTQ members. We really appreciate you guys. Um, before we begin, we'll, let's take a moment to ask if there are any per, if there are preferred, ask if you have a preferred name or pronoun that you make that known if you are comfortable doing so, whether that's publicly or privately, and this will be respected. And that's just like a really quick welcoming message. Um, for me, right, my name is Tammy. My pronouns are, for the most part, she, her. Um, what is your name? That's a great thing. That is a great way to engage respectfully and make sure that someone knows without a doubt that they will be safe in your space. I'm gonna pause here and say that diversity, inclusion, equity, and accessibility are, there's a lot to it. This particular uh, speaker rate event, this particular slide goes through some very basics. Another portion of it is also acknowledging um, different communities within your specific uh, location. So for instance, um, part of a welcome message for a lot of organizations here in the Pacific Northwest is a land acknowledgement. Um, a land acknowledgement is acknowledging that you are on um, indigenous land or that indigenous peoples these were their homelands, um, specifically the tribes or uh, peoples that were on that particular piece of land. Um, that is becoming a very common thing, especially as many tribes here are trying to reclaim their specific communities and their traditional ancestral areas. And there's been a lot of talk about that. That said, um, there are also other pieces that are a little bit more complicated. I could also kind of comment on them if there were any questions, of course, that we have. Um, but for this moment, I'm going to kind of focus on Latinx, Latin, um, Hispanic, and LGBTQ voices. Um, in the next slide, I kind of want to take a moment and go through what all of these sources are. So Burnability has a wonderful inclusivity statement. It is long, it is specific, and it is very to the point on what they are for, what they are about, and what they will and will not tolerate um, in terms of what happens in their community. Um, there is also resources on racism and birding, um, queer uh, birders and what that looks like. 
how to be a welcoming and inclusive birder, which is a really, it's a short list, but it's actually a really basic good list of how to make a space that feels comfortable for everyone. And at the very, one of the very bottoms we have our Latino Conservation Week. Latino Conservation Week is amazing. Um, if you are interested in engaging and creating opportunities with these communities, um, I would suggest checking out this website. With that, um, that's kind of what I have prepared for you guys. Um, do you have any questions for me? I'm happy to answer anything or go into depth if needed. I'm going to raise my hand again. Uh, oh, sorry. I'm Nancy Howell. And we, right now, of course, we are still doing our virtual programs, uh, as you can tell. And, but once if we get back to our physical place where we do meet at one of the nature centers uh, in the, the park system, um, you know, we don't own it. How, do, do we talk with the park folks to ask about their um, uh, inclusivity and, 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 you know, the welcoming safe space? Because, you know, it, again, it's not our space. It is the park space. So, so. Mm -hmm. What would, what do you suggest? So, okay. Um, if I'm understanding this, you guys are having activities in a park space, and while it isn't owned by you guys, that activity is specifically led and organized by you, correct? Right. Great. And I guess it could be bird walks, right, Michelle? You know, our, our bird walks that we have, of which lots of them are in the park system. Not all, but a lot. You know, and accessibility mm -hmm. is an important one, too. I would say for that specific moment, focus on creating that specific field trip or outing to have a welcome message. And you can't obviously speak for the park, but one would hope, I mean, it's a park that's open to diversity, inclusion, and equity. But with that said, if, for instance, um, I'm leading a bird walk, I say in the welcome message, hi, my name is Tammy. Um, I just want to thank you guys for coming to this activity sponsored by blah, 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 blah. Um, we value and encourage XYZ. And I want to take a moment and remind everyone this is a welcoming and inclusioning, in, inclusive space for BIPOC and LGBTQ plus community members. Um, if you have a preferred name or pronoun, please feel free to let me know, uh, and I will respect that. And you can either do it privately or publicly, however you feel most comfortable. Because let me put it this way, you're not owning the space, you're owning the activity. Does that make sense? So you own the bird walk, and therefore that is your opportunity to make that particular space the bird walk inclusive and equitable. It doesn't mean that the park is, itself is inclusive and equitable, but that means that you specifically are making your activity known to be inclusive. Um, however, with that said, you could approach the park management and say, hey, our organization really values inclusivity, diversity, and equity. How does your organization feel about it? Do you guys have a diversity statement? And they can reply back with, this is how we feel about it, blah, 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 blah. Um, and then you can kind of judge. Do you want to keep using these spaces? Um, but I think the best way to handle it is kind of just own the activity you're doing, not necessarily the space it's in, especially if it's an outdoor space. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Absolutely. Does anyone any else have questions? any questions? 
Yeah, I'm just asking if, if anybody this else is, has questions. This is I great. know I, I just I just uh, wrote in the chat to Betsy if these these sources that are on the screen right now, if we can have them either on our website or some of them on our website, because um, I'd like to look into that uh, the one from Ray Brown. Yeah, I think he does uh, bird talk. Is that right? Is that the same? I believe Ray Brown so. Yeah. Or? Okay. Mm -hmm. And I'm happy to give all of these sources. I also have other sources as well that I'd be happy to share with you guys. Um, would you like me to email them to you? Or email a version uh, of this, this slide deck to you guys? Yeah, I would appreciate that. This is Chris. Oh, absolutely. And yeah, I, I mean, have, our, our guardian of nature, we're also coming up with a uh, again, a, a statement uh, for inclusivity and, and mm -hmm. um, so on and so forth. So this this will help us. Betsy, were you going to say something? I think Chris was ahead of me. Yeah, oh, I think okay. Chris was about to ask a question. Yeah, it's just a comment. So I don't know when we publicize where our walks are going to be, if we include any information about accessibility. Might be if we have some information that might be helpful. So yes, know absolutely. That, uh, it's an accessible path or not. No, that's actually a really good point. I'm glad you brought that up. Yes, um, with your publishing information about bird walks or field trips or anything that requires people to be at a place, please give accessibility information. Um, are the paths paved? Are they not? Are there portions of unpaved paths? Is there uh, electricity at the site? Water, bathrooms, handicap ramps, anything like that. Any information you have, please publish it, publicize it because it really helps people plan ahead. And the length of the walk as well. Is it a 30 minute walk? Or is it like an hour hike up really steep incline? Um, what kind of shoes might they need? Just Things like that. Um, I'll, for instance, one of my friends um, is chronically ill, and while they don't use a, a, any kind of mobility device, they do tire very, very quickly. And having that information beforehand allows them to plan ahead and enjoy the enjoy the activity more. To be honest. So yeah, absolutely, they should do that. That that would be fantastic. That is a great point, Chris. Thank you. Again, anyone else with a, a question? I don't have a question. This is Michelle, but I just want to say you mentioned the bird ability, and uh, we do follow them on Instagram, and I've learned some great tips through their postings on how to just make sure that we are being inclusive of the visually impaired. Um, just, you know, how you use hashtags, making sure you capitalize within your hashtags if it's a string so that their screen readers can read it. Also providing image descriptions um, that can be read. So mm -hmm. if they can't see the image clearly, um, then that can be read to them and they can understand what is on the screen. So I'm glad you mentioned that yes. organization. Yeah. It's, it's a great organization. They have a lot of amazing tips. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thanks for mentioning that for sure. Also, I like your lipstick. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. I, th I think we've received a lot of, again, little hints, big hints, things that we certainly could put into effect like in the next few minutes and certainly looking down the road. Uh, this, is, this is wonderful. Uh, I know we, we have just reached out to the LGBTQ community in Cleveland. Uh, working with them because we want to meet prior to maybe doing some programming with them, not for, but with. Uh, again, I always like this yeah. uh, when people are saying, yeah, I work for somebody. No, I like working with somebody. So mm -hmm. um, I think that's important. Yeah, absolutely. Um, to kind of go off that as well. Um, that is a great kind of inclusive language as well. Um, I know in a lot in my slide, 
I used for, right? But really, you want to use language that says partnering with or allowing these or encouraging these communities to lead you. Because really, I mean, that's, that's how you get communities involved with your organization, make them honestly have a good investment in what you're doing. Um, so yeah, absolutely. With, not for. You're, that is absolutely right. That's awesome. I'm going to have one more real quick question if every, everybody doesn't of mind. Um, so if we were in, going into, say, a uh, neighborhood where it was primarily uh, African American, uh, what, who, what leaders would we speak with? Um, I know churches are, and, and you know, spiritual centers are really, really important. Um, where would we really go to, again, talk with uh, uh, adults in the neighborhoods to, again, find out what would work for, um, again, the, the, their neighborhood and, um, you know, be inclusive there? Um, so I am not um, BIPOC, or rather I am of indigenous descent. Um, but obviously I am very, um, I am white. Um, so I can't really speak as to like what might be best practice there. However, what I can say um, is that when you're going into a community, please reach out to community center leaders. So what I mean by that is, for instance, um, in Hamilton, Ohio, Boys and Girls Club of America has a wonderful community center program. They, these leaders, specifically within this community center program, are very in tune with what the community needs, especially the younger generation. Um, that would probably be the best place to start, is to simply look up what community centers are available. Um, also, reach out to schools. A lot of schools are very, of course, in touch with what is going on in their community. And there are so many teachers that would love the opportunity to help do outreach and work with organizations that want to do environmental outreach. That would be a very good place to start. Okay. Again, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Alrighty, well, I just want to, again, thank you so much, Tammy, for your time, for the, your, your expertise, and again, giving us so many tips, little ones, big ones. Um, I, I hope that we can run with many of these ideas and um, make our, our organization uh, a better place. Thank you Absolutely. so much. Thank and you I want to thank me. everyone for, for joining us this evening. and. Uh, I hope everyone has a great rest of the evening and uh, day. And what time is it out there in, in uh, Washington? Is it uh, three hours or four hour difference? We're three hour difference, so I yeah. believe it's six oh, o'clock. Yeah, no. how about that? Yeah, yep. it's six o'clock. Yep. Time for dinner again. <laughs> Alrighty. All yeah. right. Thank you again. Thank you, everyone. Have a great evening. You Good too. Night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you so much. Thank you.